the meeting to order for Monday, November 2nd, 2020. And um, start by approving the agenda. That's all the board members have seen the agenda and uh, fine with it. Make a motion to approve it, please. Chris, I would yes. like to uh, make an amendment to the agenda. Okay. Uh, I was at a meeting this afternoon and I was requested to uh, put on the agenda a meeting, uh, uh, agenda item about health officer as more and more uh, restaurants and stuff are getting issues about who can be in their restaurant and how to do that. Should we be advertising for um, a full, you know, a, a, not a full, but a health officer. Temporarily full, temporarily full time health officer. Right. Okay. Take care of that after the uh, manager's items. That'd be fine. I'd also like to add an item on an item on education for the board for sensitivity and anti racism that I think um, Bill might have some insight on. Okay. Do that immediately after Mark's or uh, Mike's um, addition. Okay, with that, um, if somebody wants to approve the agenda with those changes, we can move forward. I make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Somebody second it, please. Second. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Consent agenda items. Simply the minutes of the October 19th meeting. Uh, liquor license for the farmhouse flowers LLC operating at 2007 Guptill Road. Uh, appoint a DRB member, Andrew Strenstus. I don't know if that's probably not right, but as an alternate term ending April 30th, 2021, and um, move a DRB meeting alternate Harry Shepard to a member's position term ending April 30th, 2022. Somebody wants to approve that consent agenda. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. There's a second. A second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion approved. Okay. Um, obviously, uh, tonight is going to be perhaps a little bit lengthy. Um, before we move into the public conversation, um, I'd like to address the viewers that are here tonight. Um, I'd like to read um a little letter that i put together and if you allow me the time to get through it i will um when i finish i will turn the meeting over to mark and let him take it from there no so i'll begin and i had to put it on paper because it's going to be tough for me to get it through get through it so first I want to uh, let you know my wife and I have been overwhelmed by all the support from our neighbors and even people that we that don't know us. We have received hundreds of kind and understanding emails, messages, texts, phone calls, and posts. We apologize that we have not responded to all of them, but no, they have kept us all going the last couple of weeks. As you can imagine, my wife, Leanne, did not want me to ever run for office any time, except for the first year as a select board. Why? Because she figured something would happen like this, and I guess she was right. Of course, neither of us ever thought some of our neighbors would ever become the kind of bullies you see in other places, but I guess we should have. It was kind of obvious from that infamous meeting about the banner and again 
a bad choice of words on my part, but you kind of get distracted when there is someone at the meeting that is bouncing around in his chair with anger and shouting. There was clearly no room for any discussion. So now I have, now that I have the floor, I will tell you in simple words what I was not able to say then. Knowing how things are going everywhere else and knowing this town fairly well, I thought maybe it might be better to try to include everyone to avoid possible graffiti, destruction and division that has erupted everywhere else. Why can't this be the town that does not point at differences and we instead include everyone equally? If I'm not mistaken, there was graffiti. Something happened to the banner and now there is big division in our community. Imagine that, the three things that I was hoping to avoid, which is why I tried to make a couple of suggestions. I really find it interesting that when the news report about the vandalism came out, there was no mention about the, how the select board chair had expressed concerns that this could happen and made suggestions about somehow including everyone equally to avoid it. It makes me worry that perhaps unrest was the goal. Well, all I will say is that unrest was not caused by me and maybe it could have been avoided. I know that you have made up your mind about me and I am, and I get the feeling who, about who I am. And I get the feeling that was already cast in stone before the banner meeting but I want to share something with you. Yes, I can build a house from the excavation of the ground up to the roof. I can come exceptionally close on figuring what it will cost for the construction project, but I can't read very good. Clearly don't express myself well. My spelling is not perfect. And sometimes my handwriting is a little rough. So why would somebody who probably, if they went to school now, would have been classified as having a learning disability, think that they would ever be able to run for any kind of public office? The answer is, I really do care about people of this town and this state. And I think if I stick my neck out, I can do something good for those who don't seem to have a voice. Any other time, even if even only a few years ago, I probably could have made these same mistakes and people, especially people from this community, would have understood or would have simply asked me, is that what you really meant to say? We would have a discussion and we would have all moved on with our lives, whether we agreed or not. I'm sorry that you think that the fact that my wife and I were raised in this area and taught by our families that we should treat everyone equally, no matter who they are, makes us a racist and ignorant. If that really is the case. Thank you for your input. But we prefer to stay the way that way because we would never want to act as judgmental, hurtful, or cruel to any other person just because they didn't completely agree or understand us no matter who they are. I hope it is worth it because Leanne and I can carry on either way. If this, either way after this, knowing full well, it is not us that did this to the community. We also feel, will feel quite comfortable walking the straight line down the middle and believing that every person, no matter who they are, there is, known we believing that every person matters no matter who they are there is no good there is no need to carry signs hold rally hold rallies paint thing paint things hang banners preach or fight with your neighbors if you just simply practice being a good person to everyone again no matter who they are I will not step down from my position as a select board member. I have had overwhelming support and been told 
don't give up, don't give in, and don't step down, which has shown me that my work while serving on this board has been valued by those who understandably don't dare to speak out. I feel it is only right to let you know, let you all know, there are a lot of them out there and they are also watching and hearing what is going on. Those people are the ones I am working for and I have no intention of letting them down. Someone must be their voice and not be afraid to speak for them, even if I have to be the one taking the beating for it. The people behind this movement to get this dangerous Viennes guy out are and have been well represented. And it is obviously, it is obvious they know who they to use. They know how to use their own voices and they don't need me. I spent a lot of time thinking about my options, talking and listening to family, friends, and my other supporters out there. I obviously have also listened to you out there that don't support me but there has, have never been any talking with you. It is obvious you have no interest in that. I have thought about all the hours I have put in on, at these meetings, thought about the times I have driven back from Maine to attend a meeting because it was about an important issue that the town needed to resolve. I thought about all the things I have been accomplished that I have accomplished during my time on the board. I sure hope that someday someone could take the time to put those things in headlines so that my grandkids, when my grandkids Google grandpa's name, they won't think all I am is an ignorant racist. Maybe they will understand that grandpa is an old fashioned redneck that accomplished some things. After thinking about how this has affected my, the community, this board, my family, my friends, and myself, I have decided to step down as chair. I don't take this step lightly. I hope my supporters out there understand. And I hope my non-supporters will try in the future to be a little kinder to their neighbors. Take time to ask if you don't understand what someone is saying. Don't just think us people who talk like rednecks are always against you. We just have our own way of talking too. And for those who will be quick to judge my words again, the word redneck here means working class person from a rural area and doesn't mean anything else. And I want to make sure that this letter is attached to the minutes so that my words aren't twisted again. I'll send you a copy. Thank you. So with that, I appreciate everybody's patience and I'll now turn the meeting over to Mark. Thank you, Chris. Um, as vice chair, um, I'm gonna make a slight modification. I'm gonna extend the public portion of the meeting to 25 minutes. I think there's quite a few people that would like to talk. Um, I ask that we try to keep this organized. Um, Karen, I think you're gonna try to help with that. Um, there is a feature in Zoom that allows you to raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I think just put your name in the chat. And if anyone who wishes to speak, if you could limit it to one to two minutes so everyone has an opportunity and we do have items on the agenda tonight that we do need to get to. So I would appreciate if you don't find time tonight to speak that you reach out to the select board or Bill with any additional comments that you didn't feel were expressed this evening so we can review them, but we do have an agenda that we need to get through. So with that, Karen, I'll pass it over to you for the first public comment. Uh, well, I think the first question that's being asked is whether um, you have to be a Waterbury resident to comment. Um, I believe that's up to the board, Bill, if that's correct. I think you're muted. You're muted, Bill. I didn't hear what Karen said. It was a little garbled. I'm sorry. Um, she was asking, someone's asking if, it, if public comment needs to be limited to Waterbury residents. 
Uh, this is a select board meeting, so it's it's really the select board's decision. I would say the chair could use his discretion, and if another member doesn't think so, then I suppose you could put it to a vote. But it's not a town meeting, so the the rest of the people on Zoom don't have a say about it. Yeah, um, I would like to at least start with public comment from town residents, and if we find time, uh, we can extend it to non-residents. Okay, so I think um, Maroney Minter then would be the first to speak, and Mark, are you limiting folks to two minutes? Yeah, I think so, because I, I think there are quite a few people that would like to speak. Okay, so with that in mind, um, if we get towards that two minute mark, I'm, I'll warn you and then I'll mute you, okay, for those that are speaking. So Maroney, if you'd like to take the floor. Hey, everybody, can you all hear me? I can. Thank you all so much okay. um, for making it time. Uh, and thank you for giving the time to speak. Uh, my name is Maroney, and I'm trying to, I'm gonna try to keep this under two minutes. Um, my name is Maroney, and I'm a resident of Waterbury since 2003, when I moved here from Gabon, uh, which is a very small country on the west coast of Africa. I am a proud black man who calls Waterbury home. Uh, Waterbury is a community committed to diversity equity, inclusion, and justice. We need leaders in place who uphold and advance these values. We are a better community when everyone has the chance to meet their full potential, to work for all of us. Leaders of our community must be resolute in their commitment to equal treatment of all, not stereotypes or bias. I'm a member of the Waterbury Anti-Racism Coalition. And part of our mission and our work is to call out racism where we see it. We want to help make changes necessary to make Waterbear area a welcoming place for all of us. So we don't hear horrific stories of racism um, on our community members, such as the ones we heard at racial, uh, racial justice rallies this summer. I'm also speaking tonight as the, one of the community members who authored the petition calling for Mr. Bien to resign from the select board. I stand by that position tonight. And I want to share with you all that 464 people, Waterbury residents have signed that petition so far, demanding that Mr. Vienna resigns from the select board. This is not just about the banner or the, the banner meetings as uh, Mr. Vienna just said. Back in June, Mr. Vienna suggested that if black and brown people like myself didn't move to Vermont, we would not be having a conversation about racism. When asked about policing during a candidate forum recently, Mr. Vienne said, and I quote, I'd rather see segregated police. When calls come that are minority related, those police officers that are minority will address those issues. That way it would resolve, I hope, one thing, if there is a tragic shooting, the whole racism issue might be put to bed. Mr. Vienne went on even saying, when asked how would the dispatcher be able to tell the name of the caller, Mr. Vien said, pretty much, if the person's name is Mohammed, you could pretty much guarantee that's not a white person. Maroni, Maroni, I'm yes. going to have to interrupt you and ask if there's anyone else that would like an opportunity to speak. Okay, well, let, let me just, I just want to finish. Uh, in conclusion, I'm, I, with 464 resident of Waterbury, are calling for Ms. Vien to resign. In response to Mr. Sheplak, uh, I agree 100% that we need more uh, active citizens willing to run for office. Mr. Vien's running unopposed terms after term is problematic. If Mr. Vien does not resign, I can assure you that next term, he will not enjoy the privilege of running unopposed. At the same time, this is no excuse for his very public, very unsuitable comments, which warrants at least some response from town officials not deflection. Thank you. Okay, not seeing anyone else in the queue to speak. Uh, Danny? Hi, um, so I wrote something before the meeting, um, which I might alter <laughs> or would have altered after hearing um, 
Mr. Vien's letter, but for time's sake, I will just read what I prepared. Um, I'm Danny. I work and live here in Waterbury, and I am thankful for the chance to speak to my elected officials. This topic of racial injustice in particular is extremely important. Um, I want to address you, Mr. Vien, so I don't know you personally. I feel that you represent me as a Waterbury resident. Um, specifically, I want to say that while it might seem that many are angry at you, and I know you said you felt bullied, I'm here to tell you that many of us are not angry, that I hope the message becomes clearer tonight for me and others, that we are only here to make change. Nobody wants to hurt many of us, I'll take back, don't want to hurt you, we don't want to hurt anyone else. It's the opposite of what we aim to do. Our goal is to create a future that has less hate and less anger and more love, acceptance, and equity. My goal in speaking tonight is to ask that, as a community member, to ask you that you listen when people tell you that your words hurt them. It may not be your intention, but intention is not always the same thing as outcome. I ask that you put ego or pride aside as we all have to do, not just you, to learn how to become a better citizen and a better leader for this growing community. Change and growth are difficult and scary, but none of us is perfect and none of us have all the answers no matter how much experience we have. I ask that you be willing to open your mind to new ideas, to listen to a group of people who have been oppressed for centuries and to accept the offers of education and training so that you might gain some new, new perspective. You know, you said that you felt no one um, was interested in talking, but I can speak for myself and that I wrote you an email and asked for you to talk with me. And I know at least a dozen others did the same. I'm sure you were inundated with messages and it might've been overwhelming, but please don't say that no one extended a hand to speak because I did. Um, I at, at first was angry enough to want your resignation, but I believe it's important you stay on the select board to go through whatever education and training is offered to you or mandated to the group. I promise to do the same, to learn and grow alongside you and everyone in this community. I know the work is challenging, but if we're to make real change in the world, we have to step up and do the work. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Danny. Um, Dana Allen would like to speak. Thank you, Karen. Um, and uh, Danny, I think you put that very eloquently. Um, Chris, I think that you've served the community very, very well for a very long time. You've put in a lot of hours, and I think that you deserve recognition for that. Um, recent events and recent statements just don't align with where our community is growing and going. Um, I think it's an opportunity for all of us to work together. And so I hope that going forward, you will continue to work with the community. You will take these suggestions constructively um, because public service is hard and no one is perfect, um, but we all make mistakes. Uh, and I really think that there's a great opportunity here. And I think there are a lot of people uh, in this room now, virtual room, who are willing and able to help. So that is all I have to say. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dana. Um, Meg and Tom wanted an opportunity to speak. Um, Meg, you're still muted. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, thank you, Karen. I have a few things that I'd like to say. Um, first off, I really appreciate that we have the anti-racism coalition in town now, and I feel passionately and vehemently that we need to bring the work forward, and we certainly need to extend into education and to our young people. And I feel that as a community, we really want to do that, and I think we're poised to do that. So that's a good thing. Secondly, though, this whole process with this petition I have to say has been so damaging in ways. Um, I know that certain things were said um, at certain times. And I have to say that trying to go back to the primary source of these meetings and these videos and um, articles, I've been unable to substantiate all of the things that was raised in that petition. So, 
having known Chris Vianz for many years and appreciating, you know, him and his family as people in our community and all the work that he's done, um, I felt that it was important to try to substantiate what was being put in the, in the petition. And one of the items was able to be, and that was the one with the uh, town meeting and the select board person. And that happened and we actually followed that through and, and found out that that was resolved to that person's satisfaction, if you will, it could have been handled better. But frankly, the other things on the petition were not substantiated, at least I was not able to find them. Went back and looked at the videos, listened to the audios, and I just have to say that the way that this change.org petition came out, and I support the work of the coalition, so I have multiple things that are true. I want this work to go forward, but the change.org petition was thrown out there with a lot of things that were very, very vague, trying to follow up on it, was not able to get any sort of primary source support from the people who put it out there. So I look forward to working with everyone, but I think that this was a really, really um, unnecessary um, exercise in trying to force Chris Vianz off of being the select board chair. It could have been done in a much nicer way. I mean, if anybody who's sitting here, if our okay. Sorry, Meg, uh, the two minutes was up, I apologize. Um, so Aaron Hurley would like to speak. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I just wanna to say to the select board, I do appreciate how you all, you all, all, all give, have given over the years, you, you, Chris, I know probably in the thousands and thousands. Um, I have been thinking a lot about um, the Waterbury Area um, Anti-Racism Coalition and our role in the community. We're a very new organization and we, um, we, I just had a meeting this past Tuesday. It was in fact the first meeting we have had since um, Chris Vianz made his comments uh, two, two Mondays ago, two weeks ago now. And, um, and it was interesting that that group of people who've been meeting since June, they were very um, interested in the education piece and to like reach out to our community and use this as an education opportunity. And we've been working on an op-ed as WARC that li lists a bunch of different resources that we hope to put out to the community soon. So I wanna just say that I think that that space exists I don't think this is an us versus them. I grew up in Vermont. Um, I around a lot of rednecks and with rednecks, if you to use your word, Chris. And I think that um, Vermont or native Vermonters, whoever, you know, what you mean by that, it, those folks really truly are people who can understand implicit bias, who can understand racism like I understand it I've learned and worked hard to understand why your comments were wrong to say and I would love to hear an apology from you Chris because they were really hurtful and scary and there are kids of color in our town who heard those comments I'm sure and and thought oh I get my own separate police force now oh we're back to the time where it's you know separate but equal, now we're segregated. Like it, 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 those comments were real and they were dangerous and you're running for public office and you have a position of leadership in our town. We weren't, no part of work was out to get you but those comments obviously blew up across the state because they really hit a spot with people who were trying to combat racism as being really deeply scary. And so I just wanna say that I am sorry that, that our community has you know, felt so much pain around this conversation, but I do think it's really important. And I'm sorry that people's families have been so stressed out. And I think that Aaron, it's Aaron. a time now where we can really heal and learn together and come out of this more informed. And I think, I hope that you can take the time, Chris, to understand why um, this was a dangerous idea and take, you know, appropriate action. 
And um, okay. I've sent emails to the select board and I've- Okay, sorry, Erin, I apologize. <laughs> it's been over two minutes. Um, sorry about life, that. <laughs> life, Lee Gross would like to speak. Uh, is it possible to, to just wait till all Waterbury residents have spoken? I see a, a note from um, Maroney uh, requesting to speak again. You're asking on behalf of Maroney if he can speak again? No, uh, it's because Nick is asking because he's not a resident of Waterbury. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Uh, Mark, I leave that up to you. Um, I think Maroney's asking if he can respond. Um, I think that's fine with me if everyone else is okay with that. No problem. Go ahead, Maroney, if you could, again, sorry for limiting on time, but um, give you another two minutes and then uh, we'll move on if there's anyone else who'd like to speak after you. Yeah, so just really quick, um, Meg, um, to what you said that you've gone and watched or listened to June meeting and you didn't hear the comment that Mr. Gaines uh, around uh, if black and brown people didn't move here, we wouldn't be having a conversation about racism. I'm happy to actually go back to listen to it and send it to you specifically because everybody who was on that meeting heard those comments clearly. Now, in response to what many have said, um, yes, many here have known Mr. Gaines and his family for years. And he is well known and well respected man who has contributed greatly to our community. And uh, we all appreciate his service. I'm sure Mr. Jen, he's a good man. Uh, we are not saying everything about him is horrible. We are just calling out pattern of views and ideas that don't conform to the way a community leader should present our, uh, represent our members. It is much bigger than one person. And I'm proud of the work that work is doing uh, we are developing anti-racism coalition to undo the systemic racism at all level within our community. Yeah. Mr. Vien is just one example of a much, much bigger problem. We, we're just using his views as an example uh, to have a much bigger conversation while continuing to hold him accountable. That's all I just wanted to add. Thank you, Maroney. Thank you, Maroney. Uh, Rachel has asked to speak. Thank you, <laughs> and thanks for giving Maroney more time. So I am a proud member of the Anti-Racism Coalition as well. I moved to Waterbury about a year ago and grew up in South Burlington. And I just wanna say that this really feels like a profound opportunity to demonstrate your care for the whole of this community that you serve and to model the importance of the learning and reflection that's been described. Racism is especially confusing and mysterious for those of us who experience life with white privilege. And it's not our fault that we don't understand it since that's how the system was designed. Yet it is very much our responsibility to learn how to ensure that our actions and words do not cause harm to other people. This is increasingly important when we hold positions of power. You're on the select board because you care about this town and community as you articulated so well. I assume that you have regret for having used racist language and promoted racist ideas. And I hope that you can and will please apologize so that we can move forward into learning and reflection on how our community can be one in which all people can feel safe, supported, and that they belong, like you say you intend. Right now, it has been made clear, whether intentionally or not, that our white community matter more than our community members of color. That is not the town that I moved to, the community in which I belong, and therefore I deeply hope that we can find a path forward together. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I don't have any other specific requests for anyone to speak. So. Meg would like to speak again. Yeah. Hi, yes, thank you. Meg, I just wanted- Meg, just remember two minutes. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to make it much shorter. I just wanted to say thank you to Maroney um, in terms of sending sending where that statement was made. I couldn't hear it or find it, and I listened multiple times. Um, second, I did want to just note that I also saw on change.org that there were multiple people who actually aren't Waterbury residents. I followed through the link and saw uh, multiple posts. So I have to assume that probably there's more again i'm just saying because everybody is trying to 
I think people are trying to reset and go forward. I think it's okay to, to be, you know, forthright and transparent on all fronts. Um, so as far as that goes, but yeah, I guess just in wrapping, Chris, I'm really glad that you're going to stay on the select board. And I, I want to say that there's many, many, many people in this community um, who have expressed that. It sounds like directly to you, but it sounds like this whole group, um, you know, hopefully can go forward in, in the direction that, that people want to. Um, and I'm really sorry for living in this community for 30 years and having to endure the two weeks of what we just had in terms of how this was rolled out. Um, Truly, I, I'm sorry. I don't think it's, it's a proud moment. While the work is valuable, the process was not proud. So thank you. Thanks, um, Brenda would like to speak. Hi, I'm a Duxbury resident, um, Brenda Hartsorn. And Chris, I wanna thank you for spending a long time talking with me the other night. Um, I know it's been a rough time and I, I appreciate the courage that it's taken for you to come forward um, and the letter that you read. I think that um, stepping down as chair is, is a good move. Um, you and I had a pretty long heart to heart talk and I'm still on my journey of learning about um, my actions as a racist, a white privileged woman and I welcome um, any time to learn with you, if, if you would like that. Um, I appreciate your honesty. I think there are people that would, that need an apology. And um, I would ask you to consider that. But I think in sharing, um, when, when you talked about your grandparents, I mean, your grandchildren, um, and the headlines they might read that really stuck to me. And I think that actually you have a chance to make the headline you want um, and, and the memory that your grandchildren will remember you by. Um, so thank you and thanks for all your work. Thanks, Brenda. Um, so life has been very patient. I think it's his turn. Thank you. Uh, I'm a Duxbury resident as well and a member of WARC. And, um, I just want to clarify that the petition was not on behalf of work. Um, so just that that was kind of mentioned earlier. Um, I did sign the petition, even though I'm not a Waterbury resident. And I still think, Chris, the best move would be to step off altogether. Um, Meg noted the process was not proud. And I'll just say that, you know, and somebody else said people are not mad. And, and I was mad when I read your comments. Um, and to, to ask people to you know, sort of tamp down their anger and their emotionality is, is something called tone policing. And, um, you know, this is really important stuff. And it, um, there was harm done. But, um, you know, that doesn't mean that you're a bad person. Um, I think, as you mentioned, you know, whatever your education, your background, those things influence. And I feel that too. I mean, I'm, I'm a white male. I've had a lot of limitations to try to overcome, to try to learn this stuff, and I still mess up. I still do racist stuff. Um, we live in a, in a white dominated society, so that we're constantly being brainwashed. That's just something we all have to deal with. What I appreciate tonight is it seemed like um, you recognize that, and even stepping down from the chair, that you're looking to, to, to learn and to grow. And I think that's awesome. And um, you know, the kind of vulnerability and the humility you showed in that letter, like if you could keep that going, this could be something really powerful for our community. It's not just harm to um, adults, but you know, the, the children, like your grandchildren and others, they're watching. Um, so I would say if, if you could, you know, my suggestion would be to, to do a very public learning process and to help us see what it looks like for um, a self-described redneck to kind of um, see what this anti-racism is all about because um, there's so many wonderful things about redneck culture. It doesn't have to be associated with racism at all. And um, I would love to see an, an anti-racist redneck movement coming right out of Waterbury and joining with Wark and um, 
moving forward that way. And I still do think the most powerful way to do that would be for you to step away completely and say, I need to, to go focus on learning right now. This is not about me keeping my power and doing a show for it, but I'm actually gonna go learn some stuff and I'll be ready to share publicly. And I'm sure the community would be ready to listen um, and to support you in your journey. So I, I wrote to you and the board and I offer um, anything I can support you with. I'd love to talk to you and uh, I have resources and other people that I could connect you with. Um, but either way, um, it looks like you're taking some steps in that direction. And I, I think it's uh, much appreciated. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for hearing me out. Uh, Maureen has asked for time, Maureen McCracken. And then Mark, I don't know, I think we're nearing that 25 minute mark. So if you want to say one more or two more. Okay. Okay, hi, uh, I'm actually Kate, Maureen's daughter. I just want to say something really quickly. Um, I do want to say that I hear uh, both Meg and Chris express that they have been uncomfortable in the last few weeks and that they felt they have been bullied. Um, first, I want to say that many of us did reach out to you privately, as a couple of people have said before, um, to have less public confrontation, but it didn't seem that you listened to us or responded to any of our emails. Um, so it, it kind of hurts to hear you say that you would like us to be nicer to you because we did, we did try many, many times. Um, I also want to address that people of color have felt discomfort their entire lives. Their ancestors have felt discomfort. And so maybe this Thank week you. is a good uh, example for you to understand just the taste of what people of color experience in our country. And I really do hope that you can eventually come to understand how making yourself out to be a victim is really hurtful to people who are affected by your statements. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Kate. Um, all right, at the moment, no one else has asked for time to speak. So, Mark, if you wanna call. I would like to speak, sorry. Who is this? This is Meredith Pelkey. Oh, I'm sorry, all right, Meredith. Um, that's okay, I put it in the chat, but I think I sent it to it somebody. It may have gotten overlooked, I apologize. That's okay. So, hi, Chris. I just wanted to talk to you for a few minutes. I'm a ninth generation Vermonter. I have two black children who live in this community. Um, they were very hurt by your comments. I think you need to step down and I think you need to um, do some learning like Leaf suggested. I think you should learn about racism. I think you should learn about how your comments impacted people. Um, my boys were really hurt by what you said. Um, they love this community. We've been welcomed in this community. People know my kids in this community. Um, I'm sure you've seen them walking down the street. They're very enmeshed in this community and they were hurt by your comments. So I hope at least that you're going to apologize and do some learning. And, you know, as a ninth generation Vermonter, I love Vermont and I don't think just having an excuse that I'm a redneck is, is enough. I think you really need to do some learning and think about the statements you've made. That's all I have. Thank you, Meredith. Um, Mark, we have Danny asking to say one more quick thing. I'm gonna leave that up to you. Do you wanna call this the last public speaker? Yeah, well, I see that in the chat. Danny, um, if you could keep it under a minute. Thanks. Absolutely. I guess um, I worked really hard on trying to be empathic and compassionate in my um, approach to Chris that I think that I, I am regretting leaving out the empathy and compassion to the black and brown folks in our community. It would be really regretful if I got off this video without remedying that. So um, with what I said, um, I just want to express the sorrow and apology and empathy towards everyone in our community who were deeply hurt by the statements that Chris made. Um, and that I think there's, there's room for both, but I can't leave that out knowing how many people were affected and were seriously hurt. So I just needed to say it out loud before we go. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else that didn't get a chance to speak? We're gonna move away from the public comment. Um, 
just so everyone understands what happened tonight, chair is, or, uh, Chris has stepped down as chair. I'm vice chair, does not make me chair, but I'm gonna continue the meeting forward. Um, I think this is an extremely important conversation we had tonight and it will only start to uh, the education process for the board and for our community um, as we start to address these issues more and more. So I appreciate everyone coming out. Um, you know, we struggle sometimes to get participation in select board meetings and it's unfortunate maybe how this came about, but I think these are extremely important conversations um, that I look forward to learning. Um, and I, I assume the other board members do as well. Um, so I thank you for that. Um, I don't know if any board members want to speak before we enter into the rest of the meeting. Um, we do have quite a few things on the agenda, but um, I don't know if any of the other board members want to speak to this or Chris, I didn't know if you wanted to respond at all before we move forward. All right, with that, it doesn't look like anyone um, would like to speak. So we're gonna move on to manager's items. Is Bill still with us? Yes, Bill is with us. Yes, I'm here. I'm just trying to toggle back and forth between full screens of 50 people and agendas and everything else. So just bear with me. Okay, um, the first item that I uh, want to talk about, I sent out to the board um, the other day a memo and in it was a letter from the uh, Capital Fire Mutual Aid System. And this was forwarded to me by Gary Dillon, the fire chief. And uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, I think. Um, you know, we're just getting into the budget process and uh, we pay Capital Fire Mutual Aid for dispatching for both uh, the fire department and for Watson, the ambulance. And uh, we're paying right now uh, in 2020, um, about $79,600. So about $80,000 for dispatching. And uh, this letter, outlines uh, uh, an upgrade to communications uh, facilities and infrastructure that uh, the system is proposing. Uh, it will be paid for over 10 years uh, and each community that is a member of the system will pay about $2,500 a year. Uh, so that would be $25,000 for, uh, for the town. And I just wanted to give the select board an opportunity to understand that before we get into budgeting process. Gary is here, Sally Dillon, who is uh, uh, deputy fire chief and assistant chief, um, was Waterbury's uh, representative on this committee. So they're both here and can speak to this if they would like. But uh, I just wanted to put that out there. And as I said, if we had to do this on our own, um, just doing the research would probably cost us way more than $2,500. So with that, I'll stop and just let Gary and Sally make a couple of comments and then see if the board has questions. Yeah. Can you hear me? I'm not used to this. Uh, anyways. Uh, the mutual aid systems radio and repeater system is about antiquated. And so there's been a, a committee, uh, Sal has been on the committee for uh, more than a couple of years, and it has done a lot of research into how we can get our system into the 21st century, have a system that works for all the departments and not just a, a few that are in the, uh, more centralized area. So 
the committee went out, they did a lot of research, requested some bids. They, there was a, a movement to become part of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. That has kind of fizzled out. There was some grant processes that were gone through. And one of the um, bids, if you will, or uh, I won't even say it was a quote, an, an estimate was uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not. Um, so it was, yeah, the original um, uh, estimate was about $700,000 more than what we have now. And so the committee looked at this alternate way of doing things. And rather than hitting communities, you know, some much smaller than Waterbury and would find it impossible to pay for and, and paying for this upgrade in one year, that this seems to be the most equitable, equitable way. And it's fair for all the departments. Everybody needs, doesn't matter if you're a small department that has 50 calls a year, our call volume is down, but it's certainly more than a lot of them, but not as much as some others. But everybody needs those towers, everybody needs those dispatchers, everybody needs the radio system. And so that is the fairest way to uh, approach this. And it's spread out over 10 years so that it doesn't hurt communities in the, in the pocketbook in one year. And, and that's really what they're trying to do is not impact these departments that truly cannot afford, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in one year. Um, I or Sal, who's been on the committee and done a lot of the, the work with uh, Public Safety Authority and the, our Mutual Aid uh, Communications Committee can probably answer any specific questions that you have, but this is gonna make everybody's communications a lot better. We're moving the tower that's in Waterbury um, from the location that it's currently at up to Blush Hill. There's some little things that have gotta be worked out, nothing insurmountable, um, but that will help not only Waterbury, but down through the Waitsfield, Moortown and Warren Valley uh, as well. So this, it's all part of it, but that's in, that's the easiest part, quite honestly. Yeah, I, I think this seems to make sense. Um, any board members have any comments? Bill, do you have any comments? Mark, I have no problems with this at all. Communications in our society is such a critical thing and especially with our first responders you know this is just a small cost and it's a cost of doing business for our community you know we need the um communication and i think the cost is gonna it, it's just a small price to pay so i'm i'm definitely in favor of this thank you bill do we need to make a motion on this um it, it wouldn't hurt. I, I think just um, having the board acknowledge receipt of the information from Capital Fire Mutual Aid and indicating to the chiefs that uh, we're on board with this is, is fine and they can communicate that back. Um, I, I think that's good enough for now. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? I, I make a motion to um, approve uh, borrowing to finance capital spending uh, for no. no, not saying the right thing, Bill. No, we're not at capital spending now. We're on well, dispatching we're equipment. We're just, I'm, I'm, I'm have, look, looking at the wrong thing on on my screen. I think all you need to do is say that the board acknowledges receipt of this information and directs the chiefs to. Uh, communicate that to capital uh, fire mutual aid and then we'll incorporate it in the budget. I think that's good enough for now. So moved. Uh, is there a second? A second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Borrowing to finance capital purchases. Okay, um, I sent out 
um, uh, three different spreadsheets here that uh, kind of walk us through this. If you look at the one that's entitled October funds 70 through 73 and 75 and 76, I think that's the one that, um, uh, of course, my computer is giving me problems. Hang on a second, I gotta find that now. So um, that first spreadsheet is really uh, the budget for the capital funds, paving fund, uh, infrastructure, uh, CIP, uh, highway vehicles, uh, fire vehicles, and recreation. And um, you know, back in the in the winter, last winter, uh, we put together a budget and made that proposed budget available at the uh, at the town meeting, and uh, we incorporated into that uh, the borrowing necessary uh, to finance the fire truck that we actually had approved back last November at the special town meeting. And at that same town meeting in November a year ago, the roadside mall was approved. Uh, and the authorization was to borrow up to $950,000 for two fire trucks and $125,000 for the, uh, for the uh, roadside mall. Uh, in the spring, uh, when we were putting the budget together, the select board, uh, had some reservations about borrowing all of it. They asked, you know, what what can we do to maybe reduce the borrowing a little bit? So for the two fire trucks, uh, although we were authorized to borrow nine hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, the budget called for borrowing nine hundred two thousand five hundred, which in effect was uh, shaving one year's life off of the. Uh, the debt service over, over 20 years. And the fact that we weren't gonna be getting the second truck until well into the second year, uh, we just got it a couple of weeks ago, that uh, that borrowing would even be less uh, over time. So um, we put that together and um, then in April, when COVID came about, uh, we made some other decisions to try to uh, to save money um, in order to uh, basically keep some cash on hand because we didn't know what was going to be happening with our revenue stream for this year. So several of the CIPs, we reduced the transfers from the operating funds. So if you look at the paving fund, we decided to keep the paving fund basically, um, uh, we held that harmless. Uh, we had proposed 447,655 in a transfer from the highway fund. And we proposed $100,000 from the pilot payment. And we proposed spending uh, about $557,000, including the debt service. Um, it does look like we will be uh, paid a full pilot payment this year. We received information from the state over the weekend. So uh, that $100,000 pilot payment will be available this year. Uh, we didn't quite spend the $500,000 in the paving fund that we had available, but pretty close, about $407,000. Bill, while you're on that topic, did they mention anything about next year's pilot payment and in that being at risk at all? Yeah, not yet. They have not. My my suspicion, and you know, we'll have to wait a little bit. But uh, I'll be in contact with our state representatives fairly fairly soon to ask them to keep us apprised as soon as possible about what next year will look like. I expect next year's pilot payment will go down because the revenue source, which is in some meals taxes, um, clearly has taken a hit. Uh, since COVID came into play. 
So anyway, um, in the infrastructure CIP, we're proposing to transfer over a little less money, um, proposing borrowing a little less money than we had originally proposed and so on and so forth down the line. So up at the top of the page, uh, to the right of the, of the budget columns, I put some notes in there. So we budgeted to transfer for operating funds 1,065,155. Um, what we proposed to do and what I've shown here is to uh, transfer 972,705, which is about $92,450 less than we had originally proposed. That money will be saved in the, in the general fund. Um, will stay there and will not be transferred to the CIPs. We had authority from the voters between last fall's meeting and this spring's meeting to borrow $1,375,000, uh, 950 for the two fire trucks, $125,000 for the roadside mower, and $300,000 that was authorized in March to finance the Two million plus of uh, CIP expenditures that that we were proposing for this year. Um, what we would be able to borrow uh, would be the one million three sixty six eight eighty. Um, the roadside mower didn't cost one twenty five; it cost one sixteen eight eighty. So that's the most we could borrow there. Uh, so authorized was one point three seven five million. We would be able to buy borrow 1.366880. Um, I think that's what I would recommend that we borrow. But this budget, those things that are highlighted in in blue uh, background, um, 175 in the infrastructure CIP, the 185 in the vehicle CIP, and so forth. Um, those highlighted in blue add up to 1,262,500, which is about $50,000 less than we showed in the budget uh, last year. So I think it would be better for us if we can make the case to a bank to lend us the full 1,366,880 that I think I would recommend doing that. Um, I think you're gonna get uh, as low an interest rate this year as, as you're ever going to be able to get. And um, getting some cash into our coffers that we can carry forward into next year, knowing that we're likely going to have a reduction in pilot payments. I think that you should borrow as much as the bank will allow you to borrow. Now, it's possible the bank might come back and say, well, the budget that was proposed for capital expenses authorized borrowing 1312890 If that's what they say we can borrow, I would, I would borrow that. Um, but in the spring, we had talked about hedging even the borrowing a little bit. So in the spring, back in April or May, when we talked about this, the board kind of talked about 1.262 million. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop for a second. The other spreadsheets that I sent out um, really are uh, two spreadsheets that um, just kind of show you what our existing debt looks like right now. and. Um, what it could be or would be if if we went forward and borrowed the 1.366880. Um, and I don't want to walk us all through that until you get to ask some questions maybe about the, the budget first. But I think if you look at those two spreadsheets, um, it contemplates refunding the 1.366 million uh, next year, converting that into a, into a bond that goes out for 20 years. Uh, and I think, especially for the fire trucks, that is what we should do because they have 20 year lives. We don't have to make a decision on the refunding tonight. The purposes of this, these two spreadsheets is just to show you 
what our existing debt looks like and what I think it would, uh, how it would be impacted if we borrowed the 1,366 this year. So I promised to stop a few minutes ago, so I'll stop talking now. So just so I'm clear, Bill, you're suggesting we borrow an additional about $50,000 to just as a protection for cash position going into the, the next year? Yeah, I, I think after I, I did the analysis, and uh, if you look at this, the uh, spreadsheet that is entitled, um, it has an A at the end of it. Um, you know, we have borrowed from ourselves uh, money for infrastructure CIP, for the grader, for the fire rescue truck, and for the fire tower truck. Um, you know, we borrowed significant monies for that. We've reduced the, we've reduced the um, amount that we owe ourselves. And in this, in the, in the spring, you agreed to cut the borrowing, uh, the interest rate on that payment to ourselves to 1.85 percent for this year. And in the 2020 column for interest for those uh, four loans to ourselves that interest tax stabilization fund interest for the infrastructure CIP at 14,030 down to the fire vehicle CIP uh, for the power truck at 38,868. Those numbers are all lower than we initially had proposed to, to uh, pay ourselves. And then going forward, I think what we should do, whether we continue to pay that to ourselves or we might borrow from EPUD, we should match whatever interest rate we get from the bank to those loans. And my guess is for, for those, it'd probably be two and a quarter percent. Um, so given the low interest rate environment that we're in, Mark, and the fact that we are uh, very unsure about non-tax revenues next year, I think borrowing this money now is, uh, is a worthwhile thing. Uh, is there a cost to it? Of course, there's a cost to, to borrowing. Um, you know, there's um, there's no question that it it will it will cost money over time. But um, the uh, what I try to remember is that on that 1.366 million, for example, if we pay that over 20 years, um, you know, it's uh, it's about $68,000 a year that we would have to pay principal and interest. And over 20 years, um, you know, that would be about 1.8 million. So it's about $500,000 more than if we just paid cash for this. But $68,000 a year, uh, it's less than a penny. And it's also, um, you know, they're discounted dollars as you move forward. The $68,000 that you're going to be paying in 2034 or 2041 is going to be a lot less valuable than the $68,000 that you're, that you're paying in the, in the early years. So I think it makes sense. I know that some members have a very different philosophy about borrowing than I do, uh, but I can only recommend to you what I think is, is best given the circumstances. Bill? Yep. Uh, question. I also, I'm kind of like you, I believe in at least authorizing the maximum so we don't have to go, go back on the situation. But going back again to Mark's question, what is the likelihood of, you know, we're, we're probably going to see some sort of reduction in pilot payments. Do you have any kind of intuition from Vermont League of Cities and Towns or something, what we might see as reduction from, from pilot? I, I, I don't yet, Mike. Um, I would hope that maybe by December or January, with, you know, when we're really in the, in the midst of the budgeting process, that we'll know that. I think we're going to get $344,000 this year. Uh, which is, you know, it's a pretty big chunk of change. And, um, you know, 
Mark can tell better than I can in terms of uh, you know what percentage of business our restaurants doing now compared to a, a year ago, and uh, you know the the pilot money comes from I think there's 13 towns that have local option taxes, and uh, uh, I don't know if business is much better in Stowe than it is in Waterbury, but Stowe has a local option tax as does. Williston, Burlington, and several other communities around here. Um, I, I don't have the information yet, but my yeah. suspicion is it's going to be off rather dramatically. That's yeah. kind of my question. I, I, you know, I didn't think it was going to be as long as toward the end of next year. I thought we might, you know, know that within the month or something like that. But you, know, it sounds like it, it's not that imminent. So we probably need to go forward in one shape, way, shape, well, or form. I, we, We'll probably, I can probably get some information, Mike, that we would have by the end of next month or the beginning of January. I'm not saying we're going to have to wait a whole year from now to, to get the okay. answer. But my suspicion based on just my own, uh, you know, going to restaurant habits, uh, which are far reduced from what they used to be, uh, and from what I've been hearing, my my guess is that these revenues are, are way down for, for these establishments that are really ponying up that 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 revenue that uh, the state sends to us. So Mark was going to say something. He might have some insight. Yeah, I'm on quite a few committees that might be able to get that information pretty quickly after the end of December, but we could probably even go off the end of October's numbers and start to understand how to budget for next year, which I think is the next agenda item. So I think we need to play it safe there and project down a certain percentage. And if it comes in, we've done that before. And if it comes in higher, um, so I, I can try to see if I can find out any information at least through the end of October, which might help us um, because when we're in January, we're already starting to set, you know, kind of a focus on yeah. budget. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, that would be helpful. Now, as I said in my memo to you, uh, what I would propose is you folks as the select board give me some direction tonight, tell me how much you want to, to borrow, and then I would uh, solicit proposals from, from the banks and uh, likely would uh, you know, give them some time and probably come back at your first meeting in December and say, okay, this is what the banks propose. Now, you know, I can ask the question of the banks a number of ways. I could say, you know, we want to borrow 1.366 million. Uh, what would the interest rate be on that? Uh, what if we borrowed 1.262 million? Uh, would the interest rate be higher on that, lower on that? I mean, we don't have to make all these decisions tonight, but I'm, I'm just, if you don't have the appetite to borrow, the full amount, 1.366, I don't want to ask that question. So that's why we're talking about this now. But my hope is that at the uh, meeting in December, the first meeting in December, I'll have worked out uh, with the bank, with the banks, what, what the best deal is. They will come back to the select board that night, get approval, and then um, you know have the money dispersed to us the end of December. And I'd like to make it as, you know, get the disbursement as late in the year as possible because the first interest payment or the first payment is due um, 12 months after the loan is, uh, is released. And if we're going to potentially refund the note, that gives me a lot of time to work with the loan bank and or the, the, the banks that uh, we end up borrowing these the money by note from uh, to convert that to a longer term. So I'm just trying to get your sense tonight uh, whether you uh, feel comfortable with any of these numbers and and uh, let me know. So I'll just talk about it. Mark. Yep. Good. I just want to ask Bill: uh, Are you anticipating any other? outside of the paving budget that you've proposed, any other major infrastructure issues, problems, projects? Yeah, so so this budget that I'm showing you here, Chris, uh, in these spreadsheets is the 2020 budget. 
I don't have the 21 budget um, ready to go. There are certain things that we proposed in, in 2021 that we didn't do. We had a couple of bridge projects in particular that we, we set aside. We set aside some of the work on the highway garage to, to do some upgrades there. Um, we will have a um, proposal for a 2021 CIP. Um, I think, you know, paving and finishing up some of the sidewalk work that is right in the middle of the downtown that isn't part of the Main Street project would probably be uh, priorities of staff uh, uh, and paving. And then if we can, you know, get back to those uh, bridge projects that we had to put on the back burner this year. Um, I still think we probably will not have as fully robust CIP project uh, list as we have in the past, just because we're still on uh, pretty uncertain ground, but um, we will have proposals there. I would, I would hope, um, and I will try to work with department heads that uh, whatever we do in 2021 can be done without any additional borrowing. So I'm kind of looking at 2019 and 20. We, we took a lot of money out of our <coughs> tax stabilization fund last year to buy that fire truck that we bought a year ago. And if you remember, um, I worked with Paul Giuliani and the select board passed a uh, refunding resolution to make sure that we could pay ourselves back, pay that tax stabilization fund or the CIP fund back, if you will. Um, so we're doing that. And I'm hopeful that between this borrowing and the fact that we have pulled in our spending and crossing fingers that our revenues are not going to drop off dramatically. We don't know about taxes. They've been coming in pretty steadily, but we still have a long way to go before we're going to know how much uh, delinquency, delinquency we had on taxes. But I'm hoping that in 2021, we won't be going back to the select board or to the voters to ask for any additional borrowing. We might I might be coming back to the select board to try to uh, refinance the debt to, to uh, stretch it out over a longer period to reduce the payments and match the life expectancy of these projects a little bit better. But I don't anticipate any bond votes, and I'm hoping not even to have any borrowing in addition to this next year. So does it make sense to maximize these uh, infrastructure projects if, if you think we got others coming? Um, would it make sense to have them drop off the docket there sooner than later so that frees up some of the money for, for anything additional coming? I, I, don't, I don't understand when you say drop things off the list. What, so, what well, when the, when the loan payments are, if you maximize, uh, I'm assuming what you're talking about is some of the paving projects. You're thinking about maximizing the uh, life expectancy of the project or by extending the, by extending the note out to closer to the... No, there's, there's really, the paving projects, if you look at that budget that that I showed you, except for interfund borrowing, there's no additional borrowing going towards the paving projects. After the Perry Hill project, which you know was, uh, I think we've paid four years out of ten so far. We haven't borrowed anything more for paving. So paving, we're kind of paying as we go. Um, what I'm talking about doing now is borrowing $902,500 toward the two fire trucks that we have just purchased, borrowing uh, money for that roadside mower, and uh, borrowing money for um, the, uh, the roadside mower and 
a part of the um, uh, tandem truck that we're in the process of buying now. That's where the borrowing that I'm talking about today uh, will will go, um, and and some of it will be going toward the infrastructure project, which you know you can pick it. I mean, Main Street, uh, it's a it's a good deal for us, but you know over the two year period, uh, two and a half year period, we're going to pay whatever you know three hundred thousand dollars or so. So um, this this borrowing that I'm talking about now, Chris, is to pay for things that we purchased last year and this year. Um, not talking about next year right now. Yeah, no, I understand that, but you you had mentioned something about um, extending out some of the infrastructure projects a little longer towards the closer to the life expectancy. I was just wondering what yeah, you were. So no, uh, so in, in in that that's the um, that's the spreadsheet that shows the debt service and and what we'll be asking the bank for right now is whatever amount of money the select board decides upon. We'll be asking the bank to issue us that loan on a five year note, and then so let's just say you you choose the you know one million three sixty six eight eighty. On that spreadsheet that I showed you, um, going forward, uh, we would take that five-year note next year at one one million three sixty-six eight eighty, and I just I projected a three point two five percent interest rate. Uh, it's just a guess, but I, I I'm hoping it will be lower than that, but it's a it's a reasonable guess. Then in 2021. What I would do is work again with Paul Giuliani, refund that note, uh, refinance that, and, and change over that note from a from a, a five-year note to a twenty-year note. And in 2021, we would simply pay, moving over to the right on that line, we'd pay forty-four thousand dollars of interest next year on that note. Uh, and we wouldn't pay any principal. And then in the following year, 2022, we'd make our first principal payment uh, for that 20-year note. Now, when we make that decision a year from now, Chris, maybe the board will say, well, you know, we're okay with uh, refunding the note and turning, uh, you know, $900,000 of it into a long-term bond for the two fire trucks. But you know what? Let's pay for the Let's pay for the uh, roadside mower and for you know some of the sidewalks and paving projects. Let's let's pay for that over five years. So those are things we can decide a year from now. But I'm just showing here that if we refunded the whole thing, uh, you'd be paying basically for the fire truck, for the roadside mower, and for Main Street over a 20-year period. Bill, I think your assumptions are right. I think three, even 3.5%, 3 we may even be able to do better than that as rates are kind of, as you know, they're almost in a falling mode. So I think uh, your assumptions are good. Again, I would probably err on the side of, you know, going for the larger amount. It's kind of hedging our bets. And I think it's just a, Good decision, and we don't have to come come back. But that's my opinion. I would like to hear. I'm curious what other people think. I I'd echo that, Mike. Um, I I think that I that I trust Bill's gut on this, and if he feels like we ought to uh, we ought to go for the big amount at the lowest rate right now while we can. Um, I say I say that's the safest bet. I don't have any issues with that either. Um, can you tell me, Bill, when when our last payment there on the Main Street project was done as far as our 2 percent Got another year? The project is scheduled to run through uh, June of 21, Chris. So probably, uh, you know, we've paid, uh, this year we paid 160,000 so far. 
that's probably going to be um, higher than that. Um, I'm not sure what I projected. Um, yeah, the the one sixty seven eight ninety five that we've paid so far this year includes uh, the water and sewer portion of what the cost is, and then uh, at the end of the year when when the project is closed up for the for the winter, uh, the water and sewer department from EFUD will will reimburse us for that. So I'm projecting one sixty for this year. Um, Last year it was uh, about 172, so it might be a little higher than the 160. And then next year it's you know the, the last six months, well, the last uh, four months of the project, I hope. So um, we'll be done with that certainly by this time next year. I think we'll have made our last payment, Chris. And that's all being paid through the current tax rate that we have right now. That's yeah. all being covered under the, yeah. I mean, that's basically the cost of the machine of the uh, roadside mower <laughs> one year, yeah. boom. Yeah. Absolutely. Right, but we, we did have authority this year to borrow $300,000 towards the 2.1 million or whatever it was of spending that we were going to do this year. And of course, the Main Street project is is part of our spending this year. So it just depends on how you slice it. It's it's 300,000, you know, out of uh, uh, 2.1 million or what have you. So, you know, it's about 15% of our spending that, that we were planning to borrow this year. So. Well, once the Main Street project's done, I mean, that frees up that money right absolutely go somewhere else so that's good uh katie do you have anything or i think we can probably move forward uh bill i assume this is a motion yeah it, a motion to authorize me to uh, seek to borrow up to whatever my recommendation is the one million three hundred and sixty six thousand Katie, do you, have, do you have anything you want to add? Um, I would just say I'm on board with Bill's recommendation. And also, Bill, I would love to meet later whenever you're free to go over this point by point with paper. That'd be awesome whenever you're available. Yeah, sure. The joys of fund accounting. Yeah, thank you, Bill, for putting this together. Um, I think it, I, I've stated before that I think it makes sense that we try to amortize some of the spending over a port, at least a good portion of the lifetime of some of these large investments. And I think rates are at a great position right now. It makes sense to do some borrowing. Um, and I think it will create some savings. And I think the idea of reconfiguring some debt too is a, is a good one that we should explore further. Um, can I get a motion then? It sounds like we're all in agreement of um, allowing Bill to Bill, how do you want the motion to be stated? Um, authorize the manager to uh, to solicit proposals for borrowing up to one million three sixty six eight eighty. Would anyone like to make that motion? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, well, I have too many screens open. I think there's there's more manager items plus the ones we added. Yeah. So the the final manager item is simply to have a brief discussion with you tonight about um, about borrowing uh, and I mean about the 2021 budget. And um, in the memo I sent to you the other day, um, I just said, we're still flying a bit blind um, with regard to revenues. I think we've had a little of that cleared up just over the weekend uh, that we will receive the full pilot payment this year, it appears. 
Uh, we're still waiting on the taxes to do um, uh, in a week or so. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've collected over a million dollars in taxes today, I think Karen told me. So I just want some input from the board about what you might have as a goal next year. Um, I think that it appears, you know, COVID at, at the moment is not abating. Uh, it's going in a direction in terms of new cases that none of us wants to see it go. And there's more and more talk about uh, potential, you know, additional shutdowns as, as uh, painful as that might appear. Uh, but right now, that seems more likely than just everything is back to normal uh, on January 1st, you know. So um, I just wondered if the board had any direction to give me uh, about next year's budget. And as I said, um, it's not necessarily an easy to get there because there's, there's, you know, a million ways to get to the same uh, point. But if the board decides, you know, hey, we set a tax rate this year at 51 cents, even though the voters authorized 55 cents, uh, we want a tax rate no greater than whatever you feel comfortable with. That's probably the easiest way for me to have some good direction because if you tell me you want the tax rate, uh, you know, to to increase by more no more than five percent, well, it was fifty one cents this year. That means it's fifty three and a half cents next year. Um, if I have a municipal tax rate as a target, then when we get information about um, pilot payments and current use payments and all the other payments that we get from the state, I can, you know, manipulate those numbers. And at some point I'll be able to say, okay, that kind of accounts for the non-tax revenue that we have that leaves us with this amount of money to get to that tax rate. And then we can uh, set a sp spending budget knowing the limit of what we spend. Um, typically, you know, I go to the department heads, I ask them what they want to do, they put together a whole proposal, you know, we want to grow this program, or we want to, you know, add that program, we want to buy this vehicle, we want to do this, and, you know, I work with them and I, you know, kind of package it to what I think is palatable, and always with an eye on how much cash we have on hand which ultimately helps decide how much we're going to have to raise next year. But I'm not sure that it's an easy way to do a budget this year when there's so much uncertainty. So I'm just seeing if you have any questions or guidance that you want to share. That's all. Bill, I'm, okay. I'm leaning toward, and I am conservative, but especially we still have a lot of people hurting in town. Uh, I'm leaning to a budget that at least holds the budget line where, where it is. Uh, there's so much uncertainty with COVID. I think for us to look at a raise this year, unless we're absolutely forced to for some reason, I would look at some sort of budget cuts you know, in certain areas rather than increase the budget. The other thing I'm looking at is, do we want to consider, as we did this year, having only one tax payment? I don't know if that was, and maybe you could comment if that from the taxpayer was a hurtful thing, a good thing, you know, COVID's not going away. And I think we're going to have it through a good, a good portion of next year. I would like to say that I'm wrong, but I don't, I think COVID's going to be with us for a while. And I'm almost leaning to, you know, if, if, if we avoid that summertime payment and just go to a one, you know, November payment, that may be better for the majority of taxpayers. But tell me if, if I may be off base. Yeah, well, there's, 
there's a couple of issues there, and I think we need to take one at a time. I think we can have the discussion about uh, tax payment dates a little bit later. So, Mike, just to clarify what you're saying, um, you said you know you want to kind of hold the budget line. There, there's a couple of different things there. So, are you saying that you want to maintain the 51 cent tax rate? Um, are you saying that you don't want the budget any higher than it was that we pro proposed at town meeting in 2020 for spending? Are you saying that you want the budget to be a pared down budget that we came back to? Um, the um, if you if you decide that I want to keep the tax rate at a certain level, right? There's a lot of ways to get there, and you look at all your information. How much cash do we have on hand? Uh, what do non-tax revenues look like next year? And then that leaves us with how much we have to spend. Um, if you're just saying, I don't want to spend any more than we spent in 2020, you know, even after we kind of pulled things back, that's a very different thing. And I, I would suspect if we put a budget together that that captured our year-end 2020 spending, the tax rate would probably not be needing to be anywhere above uh, the 51 cents. I think we're going to have some cash on hand this year. Um, I'm not certain of that, but I, 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 I think because that pilot payment is coming through 100% this year, we're going to be okay. The, the taxes, it's still a question mark, but uh, they're coming in. To clarify, I, I was leaning toward a 51 cent tax rate. Okay. Other board members, conversation, just to kind of kick this around a little bit. Bill, any idea of any uh, available grants for infrastructure work like uh, Stowe Street? That road's getting pretty horrible. Um, um, well, there, there are grants out there. Uh, there are state programs out there. Um, Woody was talking to me the other day. Um, I think with regard to class two paving, we're in the, I, I think he said we're fifth on the list. I don't know if that means statewide or in this district, but we're in a pretty good position on uh, paving grants for class two highways, which Stowe Street is. Um, we're not in such good shape when it comes to uh, bridge program grants. You know, we're, we're much lower on the priority list there. But the big question is, you, you can be at the top of the list, but if the legislature doesn't fund the program because of their own problems, it, you know, there's no guarantee. So um, I think I'm going to be putting together a budget uh, that presumes no grant money, uh, no big grant money for these infrastructure projects or paving. We'll apply for them, certainly. Uh, and if we get them, great. But I'm gonna try to build a budget that doesn't, does not contemplate those. Yeah, I, did, I, I guess my real question was, do you, were you aware of, of whether or not the state was gonna be able to fund those? And... No, not yet. I mean, obviously there's gonna be a, a new legislature in uh, in January. There'll be some different people there, so they're going to start from scratch. So, Bill, well, well, Chris brought it up. Something like Stowe Street. You know, if we are trying to time grants, are we running risk of not being able to do a grind and pave? Um, are we? Is, how do we? How do we work to make sure that we're not losing an opportunity to do something that might be more affordable than having to do a, a complete repaving. Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, you know, Stowe Street does have some, some issues. And our preference would be to at least do uh, some work on the part of Stowe Street between Main Street and, and the bridge that, you know, the, the Main Street project is uh, touching but not uh, completing. Um, 
you know, I think we should put ourselves in a position with the way we use our cash flow is that we probably should do the, the projects when they need to be done. Um, there's, we have other class two roads that are in need of, uh, of assistance in terms of paving. So if we decide we're gonna do Stowe Street and, and the, the grant money is not available this year, we end up doing it anyway. We pay for it, we finance it for ourselves. And then the next year, you know, we, we program whatever, you know, Winooski Street or whatever class two street that is next in the queue. So uh, if we, we kind of got into that trap a number of years ago where, um, you know, we had proposed to do Stowe Street, but oh, the grant money didn't come through. So we pushed it off and waited a year, the grant money didn't come through. And then, you know, the, the road deteriorates and it gets to be way more costly than we'd like to see. I'll, uh, I'll say that I also hope that we can try to keep the tax rate flat um, as a goal. I think there are gonna be a lot of people that are struggling and we don't know what's gonna happen on a federal level. I think a lot of people were held up by some of the money that came out of Washington, but without that maybe going into next year, I think there might be some people that are really hurting. So I think anything we can do to try to not impact that. Um, in terms of gram list, what do you know what the percentage growth was this year? Uh, hang on. I know there are quite a few houses being built, but I don't think we have major projects that were that are coming online, like the hotels we had in the past. Right. Um. But overall, Mark, we're probably seeing an increase in values, especially with the in migration of people from out of state, you know, raising some, some, you know, the selling prices of some of the houses on the market. So, which I that would be. I don't know if we, if we're not reappraising, I don't know if that comes into effect yet. Right. It doesn't. Well, it, it, it does a little bit. Yeah. But. So between 2019 and 2020, our grand list rose not quite nine tenths of one percent. Um, you know, I would I would hope that maybe we'd have a percent or or a little bit more between uh, 20 and 21. Early in the season, and you know, people like Nat and Chris could probably speak to it better than us, but I know that our zoning office was quite busy and we had a lot of things, not necessarily, I mean, there were, there were houses that were built, no question about it, but people did a significant renovations. They added decks and, uh, you know, uh, apartments over garages and things like that. Uh, but I, I, you know, I can ask Dan and have, uh, report back to you at the at the next meeting. I don't have a good handle on it. I would probably budget right now if I had to a uh, one percent increase and just see where that takes us. Yeah, I don't know that it uh, surpasses last year's growth by a whole lot. Um, I mean, I'm I'm probably as busy as I've ever been. Uh, some of it's in this town, and some of it's in Barry Berlin area. <clears throat> but uh, I know from other contractors that uh, everybody is pre pretty right out straight. Um, just seeing what's going on here in town. I mean, we have a couple bigger, bigger projects that are going to come on the tax roll. Right. Stuff that um, uh, going on down in the village area where the old first Vermont bank was there. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, um, Mike Bell's at the Bell Block there. That's uh, that's right. And you've here. got you know the, the building there on Stowe Street. But on the on the flip side, and we have to be careful. Um, nothing came of it, but you know the 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 folks who own Pilgrim Park, um, you know they 
they um, they appealed their um, well, they wrote a letter suggesting that they were overvalued uh, based on the fact that you know they've got properties that are vacant, they're having a difficult time finding leases. Um, you know, the hotels uh, I think are often uh, appraised on a, on an income basis. You know, so there could be even though we had some growth in the residential um, uh, rent list in particular, uh, there could be some losers, if you will, from the grand list on the commercial side. Uh, so we've got to be careful. So I mean, I, I think that I wouldn't budget for more than a percent um, just to be, to be safe. We didn't even get a percent last year. So um, I, I think there's question marks out there, I guess. So I've heard a couple say, um, hold fast at 51 cents. Is that a consensus of the board for now? Yeah, I'm happy with that. As, you know, my biggest concern, like I've always expressed to you, is not uh, not backing off from the amount of paving that we've been managing here in the last couple of years because we're making some headway getting to the goal of having a better cycle of, of maybe repays rather than costly complete re reclaim and, and repave. So yeah. if we can continue that and meet that goal. I think we'll be saving a lot of money at the end of the day. I agree with what Chris says. You know, we, we want to, I think, hold that tax rate at 51 cents and do what we can to maintain some of the projects that are ongoing. Um, I would echo that. Um, talking at our <clears throat> last meeting where we discussed this, um, I was on board keeping the tax rate the same um, to help with the financial burden from COVID that our community felt. Um, I don't own a house in the community yet, but I have heard around the community um, people's opinions and thoughts and their stresses with it. Um, I kind of thought back to that meeting uh, a couple different times, kind of kicking myself, even if we had just raised a cent, maybe a little bit more than, you know, what we agreed on, and it'd still be less than what the taxpayers approved, like we wouldn't be going up to the full 55 cents, but I'm, I'm okay with keeping the same or raising it just a cent, because um, it's still less than what they approved. So. Yeah. Um... I would go even one further and say that, um, you know, with all the uncertainty that we're going through right now, um, I think we're headed for a major ripple effect. You know, we're, we're only just, we're less than a year into this thing. And a lot of people are still trying to figure out their own existence. And, um, I think a year from now is when things are really going to start to hit, and uh, you know we're going to find out who actually who actually was able to hang on through this whole thing that we call COVID. And um, I think there's going to be a lot of places that are suffering next year uh, financially, and there could be a pretty big hit to our bottom line. Um, I, you know, I, I don't want it to be a scare tactic, but I think that we need to be realistic um, and say that that, you know, 1% growth might be negated. Um, so, yeah, holding the line on this, um, I think, is probably the least we can do to have a very conservative budget. And I think the big concern comes, as it was kind of mentioned, I'm really concerned about commercial real estate uh you're you're seeing it may be a positive for business but a lot of businesses are, are embracing virtual business uh commercial real estate people are learning to operate remotely and if corporate headquarters and such they could downsize and have their staff, you know, it may be better for their staff so they don't have to commute. You know, like we have people who work in Burlington, they don't have to commute into Burlington. 
that's going to be a plus. We do have some commercial real estate that people are com commuting from the hinterlands into Waterbury. You know, if they could live up in Belvedere and, you know, be virtually online, that's going to really impact a lot of commercial leasing. So it's something that I guess we, as I think Nat says, we're probably not going to see what's going to happen for another year. So if we could hold the line, at least temporarily, that's going to be helpful. Well, to your point, Mike, um, <laughs> you know, to speculate that uh, the state complex might become almost obsolete at some point. Um, You're right. Did you lose a lot of the pilot, you know? Right. Unless it gets sold off to private private industry or private investors could become a business incubator who knows what it's going to become right. nobody's got a crystal ball brave new world all right bill do you have everything you need for that to move forward for tonight no, I, I'm I sure your, your challenge of keeping it flat again is always <laughs> a tough one, but uh, we appreciate the work that you do. Uh, I, it's goals. just a lot easier to know now and start thinking about that now. So um, we'll 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 work on it, keep you apprised, and uh, we'll we'll all get there. I think. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. No, no motion, right? No, no, no motion. Okay. Um, I think next, Mike, you had added the health officer discussion. Yes. Um, we had a meeting of uh, Waterbury leaders from different sorts, and there was a lot of discussion about, especially you can relate to this, Mark, a lot of, especially the restaurants were really concerned about what do we do if, if an employee as a staff member, or if they have a customer, you know, go in and, you know, should, what advice should they give? And I think the consensus around the table was, it would be really helpful to have a health officer. And I know we've kind of been patching that health officer job along through, you know, town staff and select board folks, uh, you know, they really are urging that we proactively seek someone for the position of, you know, health officer. And I would like to get people's input on that. I'm sure Bill would, Bill and Chris would be very happy about that. Well, just so everyone knows, um, right now, Chris, um, and this will be changing, but right. uh, we, we don't have a health officer right now. Um, uh, Beth Ann Mayer was the last health officer that was recommended to the uh, Department of Health by the select board, and she had been appointed. Um, her term expired a couple of months ago, and she asked indicated she had no desire to continue. I have been uh, the deputy health officer for the town for a, a long time now, uh, and uh, you know, nominated to that position by the select board, and I have my appointment from the commissioners of the Department of Health. Uh, when Beth Ann uh, Mayor stepped down, or did not get reappointed, uh, and the select board did not appoint anyone, the law states that the uh, chairperson of the select board is the de facto health officer. So I don't know if Chris has received any calls, but um, uh, he's, he's on the list somewhere as health officer. Um, the system is not a great system. Um, we're the health officer and the deputy health officers are agents of the state department of health. Um, it's a it's a town uh, it's a position that's nominated by the select board. Uh, would sit with the select board as a member of the board of health if that situation was ever necessary. Um, there's marginal 
nominal training that's offered by the state from time to time. Uh, the state health department along with DLCT provides a training uh, every once in a while for health officers. There's a manual that gets sent out to the health officers. And uh, far and away, the biggest uh, call for the health officers time in my history has been uh, tenants calling to have um, the state's um, rental housing code uh, enforced. Um, there is discussion in the health manual about, you know, health officers' ability to go into restaurants and inspect them. Uh, but typically, full-time people from the Department of Health do that. Uh, I'm a little skeptical right now, simply to say that whether we appointed somebody different or not, that uh, we have anybody who's got the qualifications to make decisions, especially with regard to COVID. Um, uh, so I certainly would not be comfortable doing that. Uh, you know, there's been words circulating around, rumors uh, have been called by the press a couple of times. Well, I've heard there's, uh, you know, there's an issue with COVID at the American Legion. And I've heard that folks from there have been going to such and such restaurants. Is this true? Um, you know, you see a post on Front Porch Forum from one local restaurant seeking uh, a number of uh, wait staff and cook positions. Well, does that mean that people have quit there? I don't know. Um, I don't have any qualifications to go into any restaurant or any kitchen and uh, inspect it. I mean, I could use the health department manual, but when it comes to COVID, I'm not, I'm not sure that I would be uncomfortable ground doing any of that. Totally understand, Bill. And I, but I think that's where a lot of the restaurant community and some of the other business community is maybe looking at the health officer as being a resource, you know, maybe not that person, but have, you know, we're really in a crazy world right now and people are looking for help. And that's, I think, what these folks, community leaders around town are looking is that where can the business community get, get help? And they think it would be somehow through via a health officer. I'm not saying the health officer is going to be the one, but at least maybe being a, a resource person. And uh, I'm not saying at all that Chris, I know, was appointed via his role as select board chair. And I know you've been acting as, you know, the, the deputy health officer and basically acting in that role. But I guess they're looking at maybe there is someone, you know, a doctor in our community who would be willing to step forward and go into that role, you know, by advertising. I don't, I just, I just don't know. I figured I would at least bring the subject up. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in since you mentioned my name and restaurants previously. Um, you know, right now we're following the direction of the ACCD. Um, right. It is, it is not, it is a gray, you know, even just the rule book isn't very clear. And if you look around, I, I've been to quite a few places or looked at a few, uh, many places and, you know, this, the table space and a bunch of the other rules seems like there's quite a bit of uh, room for interpretation. Um, you know, I think each of us are trying to follow the rules and, um, you know, make our own decisions on what we think is, is safe, which, you know, a lot of the industry was closing down before even the state mandated us to do so. Um, which is a tough decision. Um, I think finding someone in this position that would actually be a resource, I think is going to be the hardest thing. Um, right now we're, you know, we're in touch as a organization and as a, uh, industry with, um, the governor's office. Um, and we're taking a lot of direction from there. Um, and you know, we, we have to do contact tracing. And if there is anyone who is connected to the business, they'll call us um, to let us know. And then, you know, they try to do the backwards and they, they let us know whether they think anyone's at risk and if we should close. Some businesses are making the decision 
to close um, preemptively just a little bit, I think is of concern for safety, but some of it too is just public perception of, you know, their, their fear of not getting into the community and what that means for their business and, and, and so on. So, yeah, I mean, it's, and we, some of us share employees and that's another challenge that we're trying to navigate and it's flu season. And, you know, how do you navigate a sick employee? We always have employees that come down with flu every year. So how do you differentiate what's the right thing to do? It's, it's scary. And, you know, luckily testing is becoming a really, um, um, achievable thing. We've had uh, many employees go out and get testing. There's those pop-up tests that are uh, all over the state and I've, I've had a few already. Um, I think that's really a, a huge part of the solution is going to be testing. But, you know, if, if we could find a way to make a health officer really mean a resource that we could go to, I, I would be in support of it. But um, right now, I, th I think there's enough knowledge at a state level that we're going and using those resources uh, if and when we can and using groups like RW to help us with the communication through the other state groups like the Vermont Chamber. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's my, my quick and dirty of, of that world. Yeah, I, I really think if it's something that the board wants to consider, um, it's a lot more complicated than simply advertising and trying to recruit somebody to do this. First of all, you know, you want to make sure you have a, a really good job description that uh, is backed up by authority. If you're going to call the person the health officer, it's the appointment is by the, um, the director of the Vermont Department of Health, not by the town manager or by the select board. It's a nominating process. We would have to work with the health department to to make sure that we understood everything that this person would uh, would be expected to do. And then, of course, it's the matter of how you compensate them. Uh, uh, and and this is uh, this is a, a challenge. And you know the, the the rental housing code stuff is really it's awful. I mean, you go into these some of these places that people complain about and. Uh, you wouldn't want your dog to live in that place. And then you, know, you just kind of find yourself caught between a rock and a hard place as you try to mediate between the landlord and the, and the tenant about, you know, let's try to just move this a little bit toward a better situation. And it, it's very, very challenging. So um, if it's something the board wants me to look into, I can do that with, with some guidance from the Department of Health. But we, we would have to make sure we're on really solid ground before we send anybody out to go and, and make directives, uh, basically in our name. I think. We, we don't we don't know if if we have qualified candidates until you get the word out there and ask. You know, we do have a number of you know doctors within our community. You know, not they may not be practicing in in Waterbury, but they're practicing somewhere in, in Vermont and so at some level. And that's that's the, the ask. I think we, we well, do I need a very qualified to, individual because I know I- to do, Qualified to do what, Mike? You've got to be able to tell them, this is what we want you to do. This is the authority that you have. And uh, you know I can show you their health department handbook and it doesn't say anything about COVID, that's for sure. Well, that's that's where you have to, modify things because i think that's the challenge before us that and that's where the you know rw was the ones that are kind of very concerned about that you know they're not as concerned they, they are concerned but like if you have a business that has an employee who you could send home and they get a sick day when you have a business such as a restaurant and you know someone someone has a you know what could be COVID symptoms, you're sending them home and they're probably not, they may not be getting paid. So it's two different issues. And I, I, I think maybe, it's, uh, maybe but, but it's, could, it's, it's the, it's the Vermont Department of Health. It's their, it's state law. It, the, the town does not have any health codes. We don't have ordinances at the town level that regulate health 
or safety in restaurants or in apartments. It's, right. the, it's the state of Vermont through the Department of Health. These are all state rules and regulations. So I can't, we can't just say, well, you have authority to do this or that. Is it going to be authority that's granted in the statute? So if we want to, if we want to look into recruiting a health officer and ask them to be more proactive than we are right now, we can do that, but it's going to have to be in concert with the health department getting their blessing because it's not our goal. Mike, maybe it would make sense for us to talk after this meeting more about your discussions and start, and then we can touch back with Bill and see if it, it makes sense to get the board in support. Um, but maybe it would make, before trying to talk it through tonight, I, I, I think I understand yeah. what you're asking for, but like Bill saying, I think there's a certain limitations to what we've set ourselves up as a town, but I think your concerns on COVID and support for business are, are valid. So, and then the community as a whole. So maybe we just talk this week and, um, I can reach out to Karen at RW and have a discussion as well and, and see if there's, there is something that maybe the board can help do through that position. But um, yeah, maybe we can just do it. Um, and, and we may be able to reach out to other communities to see what they, cause I'm sure other communities are grappling with the same situation, you know, Stowe or some other commute Richmond, you know, it's worth, you know, hearing they, they must have similar issues, but I agree. Let's do that offline i'm i'm on the board of the Stowe area association and we have our big meeting on wednesday so i can uh, bring it up as a topic of conversation and see what their thoughts are on it as well great um and then i think the next item is something i added um which uh, was uh, brought up to me through email and i'm sure others have seen it through front porch forum but it was a request that the board um look at education resources um for anti-racism and also uh, sensitivity. And I know that the state mandates some of this um, as Mike had mentioned to me, but I, I had reached out to Bill and asked him to understand what resources might be available for the board. I think educating ourselves um, as we move the conversation forward um, is important. And I think education is never risky. And I think it's an important thing for us as leaders of the community to look at the resources we have available and the education opportunities you might have and take advantage of those. Um, I think we learned that maybe over the last two weeks that, you know, we all could be more educated on um, certain topics. So I think it's a, it's a opportunity to be better as a board and, and uh, yeah. So I don't know, Bill, if you had found anything, uh, Katie, did you want to speak? Yeah, just quickly. Um, I have an engagement to get to at 930. So I'm just going to add my thoughts in this really quickly. Um, I know I spoke to um, Mike and I spoke to Mark about um, my thoughts on um, going to trainings. And I think that would be awesome. I don't think we should go to one. I think it should be an ongoing thing where we can learn um, and go forward with this. I also think it would be beneficial for us and um, the group that Maroney and I believe Aaron is a part of to come in for dialogue and discussion and something, you know, whenever that works for us, uh, at least like, you know, once a month or once every two months or something, just so we can actively engage in meaningful conversation with each other. And um, yeah, I'm on board with training together, learning and making this a uh, process going forward. I think it'd be really beneficial for all of us. Totally agreed. And I also think that we should get as well as the select board, the manager, we need to also engage town, you know, the town department heads in some way, shape or form with sensitivity and diversity training. I know I've been through a number through USDA and encouraged, not even encouraged, we required our staff to take that that training. And I think it's good. There are a number of vendors that we could look at. And, you know, Vermont League of Cities and Towns, you know, I believe has train, training. And I just think it's a great idea, you know, where 
you know, you know, sometimes we all can't read people's mind, but sometimes it's the words that you use that can be misconstrued. And sometimes we all just be need to be sensitive about the words that we use. And we're, we're all guilty in some way, shape or form, whatever, you know, so, but I'm very, very much for going forward with this. So I, I don't have a whole lot of information right now. I, uh, I think Katie kind of hit the nail on the head reinforced by Mike. I think we, we do have the uh, organization in town that has already reached out to us. I am aware of uh, and know that training is available due to the Human Rights Commission. Um, We've had experience with the Human Rights Commission here in the in the past. Um, I think it was Erin, frankly, back in uh, in June, uh, talking about the Black Lives Matter, who suggested that uh, some uh, training would be available through the could be available through the Human Rights Commission. I knew that I know they do a training on implicit bias. Um, I have not yet reached out to the League of Cities and Towns, but that's a good resource, as Mike suggested. But uh, I see Erin is still on the call or on the Zoom meeting. Um, she may have something that she wants to say. But uh, I think, you know, having maybe you should designate one or two of you select board members to reach out to. Um, to Aaron or, or other members of the committee and, and see what they have to offer and, and work with them. I have already had a couple of uh, staff member employees who've come to me and said, you know, if training is going to be offered, uh, I'm, I'm very interested. So, uh, um, you know, I, I think that including uh, department heads, uh, at least down the line, is something we might want to consider as well. Um, Aaron, Aaron, go ahead. I see you're uh, commenting in, in the chat. She had both. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, yeah, I, I don't even really need to say anything. I just wanted to say that the Human Rights Commission training, I believe, is free for public entities. And um, I, I have some contacts there that I know personally. Um, so I'd be happy to, you know, do any research that you guys might need or put you in contact with people but i think that's a good place to to start and i know that they're still doing them um through covid throughout covid just via zoom i believe so but bill you and i could connect on that too if you want to um yeah that's fine i just want everybody to know that i'm 100 percent on board with this effort too um willing to be a participant in it. Um, with that, I'm going to skedaddle. Bill, I will reach out to you about connecting. Okay, you're welcome anytime. Bye, Katie. Bye, Katie. Um, I don't think we need to make a motion, but we're going to move forward, making sure that we reach out to those groups. And um, Bill, I can work with you, continue to work with you to figure out what resources are available and present them to the board. Yeah, I, I've seen a couple of the Dana just posted and the information that he just sent along the, the, the link to the Human Rights Commission. I, I have that, I printed it out before the meeting started. So uh, we're aware of that, but um, Aaron certainly reach out to me uh, with some of the contacts that that you have and uh, we can we can go from there. Definitely. Yeah. I yeah, I you know, I'm not an expert on everything that's happening in Vermont for sure, but the WARC, we had a meeting like I mentioned on Tuesday and it was like our first meeting since kind of this community conversation happened and people were very interested in kind of putting out resources to people, really wanting people to like, you know, understand how they can engage with learning about um, you know, racism and anti-racism and bias and stuff. So we have a really good list going. So I'm kind of going to tidy that up. So I'll share it with you, Bill, and it, it'll probably be something we kind of put out some way to the whole community. Um, but 
again, if you ever have questions, Bill, just email me. You have my email and we can, and I can hook you up with resources um, kind of that are specific to your needs too. And there's a lot of great people who can do that in town and who are on this call as well. Is anyone who's still on the call want to speak to this before I call for a motion to adjourn? All right. Um, seeing no one, I appreciate everyone. Um, I know this wasn't an easy meeting, but I think it was an important one and I appreciate everyone's time tonight and uh, look forward to uh, where we go from here. So I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Have a good night, everyone. Good.